That's a beautiful thought, isn't it? It sure is. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in your Bibles this morning. First Corinthians chapter number 15. If you're able, would you please stand with me for the reading of the Word of God? And if you're not able, just remain seated. It's okay. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse number 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, 
if ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remaineth unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yea, not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. I'd like to go back and read one verse, our text verse, and that's verse 10. And we'll start now, verse number 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. I would like to preach this morning on the thought of, by grace, I am what I am. By grace, I am what I am. Father, <coughs> we thank you for the morning now. We pray that the Holy Spirit will come in his great and glorious power and would lift high King Jesus. And I pray that the Father would receive honor and glory and praise. For thou art worthy to receive all that we can give times 10,000 times 10,000. Help us now and speak to our hearts as only you can. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Paul the Apostle starts this chapter, that is chapter 15, defining what real and true biblical salvation is and what it consists of. He says very clearly that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, Amen. and that he was buried, and that on the third day he rose again. And rising again on the third day, he conquered your greatest enemy, Mr. Death. Now, Paul the Apostle makes mention here not only about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, but yet that the gospel of Jesus Christ is a work of the marvelous, amazing grace of God. The marvelous, amazing grace of God. In which Paul says basically this, I am what I am by the grace of God. That's a very bold statement. That's a very profound statement. Some would say I am what I am by my education. I am what I am by how I've grown up. Human fate, I understand that. Paul had a lot that he could brag on about who he once was, but what and who he once was, was in no way, shape, or form to be compared unto who he now was. Paul the Apostle unto the Gentiles, once again, by the grace of God. What is grace? The word grace, it's God's favor toward 
sinful men and women, which are so undeserving. The Bible says that the Lord looked down from heaven to see if he would see any that understood or went in his way, and he sought and found none. No, not one. And the conclusion of God throughout all humanity is, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none that seeketh after God. God is not in their thoughts. Moses, in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, reminded the nation of Israel. And perhaps it would be good for you and I to be reminded as a nation of the United States that we are what we are today. Corporately, but yet individually. By the grace of God. God forbid that grace be in vain. God forbid. As Moses was going off of the scene, and soon Joshua would be coming on to the scene, Moses said this to the nation of Israel as a reminder. I want you to listen to what he said. I'm going to quote chapter 7, verse 7 and 8. He says, and I quote, the Lord, now this is grace. Now here, you're hearing what grace is. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more than number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you. The Lord loved you. And because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, that is out of Egypt, and redeemed you out of the house of bondage from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He tells and reminds the nation of Israel, Moses does, the leaders of that day, God did not set his love upon you because you were the smartest, the wisest, the strongest, and the most able. He says, to the contrary, you are anything but. But he says, because the Lord loved you. Which would bring to mind the question, what did they have that God loved them for? Nothing. Nothing. Now, if we think about this as a New Testament people, well, there's a parallel here with us as well that we need to be reminded about. If you'll recall the words of Paul the Apostle, and I am going to quote to you Ephesians chapter number two, and I'm going to start at verse number five, but here's what it says. But God, no, you know what? Maybe I ought to back up to verse one. Because as Moses was encouraging those of that day, that they were what they were because God loved them. We are what we are because of God's love towards us. Here's what he says in chapter 2, starting of verse 1. And you hath he quickened. That means he has given you life. He has given you life. The idea is you are on the operating table and the line went flat. And the mercy and the kindness and the grace of God's lips came to you and he breathed into you life and you became a new creature. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Well, who can love anything that's dead and in trespasses and sin? God. Where and in time past ye walked according to the course of this world? According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the, the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his, here it is, for his great love wherewith he loved us. See, he told the nation of Israel this, and now he's telling the church at Ephesus, Gentiles and New Testament believers, this same parallel truth concerning the amazing grace and love of God. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even 
when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved. Amen. And he goes on. And hath raised us up together and made us to set together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, if we think about this, we can also conclude very quickly but God commendeth his love towards us in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Where is our boasting? Where is our being? Uh, you be careful of something else making you what only God has the intention to make you to become. You be careful of the world putting you in its mold and making you something that God never intended for you to be. We are what we are by the grace of God or we are what we are by human fate. And both are totally different. God's grace was demonstrated and it was manifested in and through his son, Jesus Christ, and particularly on the life of Paul the apostle. Remember him? He says, I'm not worthy to be called an apostle. I persecuted the church. Now you take that lightly. But I can tell you those of that day who knew the name Saul of Tarsus did not take it lightly. He killed moms. He killed dads. He took them to prison. He had them stoned to death. He was what he was by the fate of the nation of Israel, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law. He was in line with it. But then one day, he heard a voice from heaven saying, Saul, Saul, what are you doing with your life? Why are you doing this? And he responded back and said, Lord, who art thou? Or, who art thou, Lord? And it was revealed to Paul God's amazing grace. And he says that grace was not put in his life by, on vain. That grace I didn't take lightly. Paul is saying, I very much appreciate it. I count the majesty of what Christ has done for me above all things in my life. My greatest achievement is to know him and to be of him and to be like him. And the fact of the matter is, once again, God's grace was demonstrated and manifested in and through his son, Jesus Christ. And the Bible teaches very clearly, but God commended his love towards us. While we were yet sinners, there Christ is on the cross. And for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I want you to note something. If such grace is taken lightly, if such grace is taken in vain for the Christian, then your labor for him will be ever so light. Your love for him will be ever so limited. You will not go the extra mile for him who went the extra mile for you. And your life will be short of the power and the presence of Christ. Again, as Christians, we are what we are by God's grace, or we are what we are today by human fate. Throughout the Word of God, His grace is witnessed and revealed and experienced by at least four facts. Well, there would be first of all, what we may call or refer to as the common grace of man or the common grace of God shared with man or a common grace that all men share or something that all men experience on a daily basis, moment after moment. The book of Psalms, chapter 19, the psalmist said, and I quote, 
Verse number one, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. This is common. Today, it has been common knowledge for all peoples to see the handiwork of God Almighty through creation. We say we need rain. God knows what we need. And God gives rain. And there is the common thought of creation that we deal with every day, but sometimes we become so ever used to. And the book of Psalms, you know, you do know, we all do know that our days are, you do know that your days are limited. You know there may come a time in your life where you're going to ask God for another day. Why don't you practice that kind of life now? You know the doctor could call you or tell you something's going to happen and your days are numbered. And you're going to go back in your mind and you're going to think or wish you could have done something a little bit different. Maybe, maybe not. We are told throughout the Word of God that we need to be taught the value of our time here. And the value of a day and what it holds and especially when it comes to this day. This is the Lord's day. This is still the Lord's day. Sunday is still the Lord's day. It's the day we collectively meet as a body of Christ. John made mention of that in the Isle of Patmos. He was in the spirit on the Lord's day. That would have been the first day of the week. The psalmist said again in Psalms chapter 65, let me quote to you verse 19 through 13. Thou visitest the earth and waterest it. Thou greatly enrichest it with the river of God, which is full of water. Thou preparest them corn when thou hast so provided for it. Thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly. Thou settlest the pharaohs thereof. Thou makest it soft with showers. Thou blessest the springing thereof. Thou crownest the year with thy goodness and thy paths drop fatness. They drop upon the pastures of the wilderness and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also are clothed over with corn. They shout for joy. They also sing. Creation, once again, God expresses and exposes himself on a very common way to man that the Lord liveth and the Lord ruleth and he reigneth over the affairs of men. Now, speaking of this morning, the Bible teaches and tells us about the days in which we have. And according to the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, listen to verse 23. Verse 22 says, it is because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. That's grace. It is because of the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. God expresses his mercy every day to every human being that his grace may be acknowledged and understood. This day is without exception. Tomorrow will be the same and the next day will be the same. This is what we would call a common grace of God. It's common to all men, moment by moment on a daily basis. God is revealing himself through his power, through his wisdom, through his understanding, and through his abundantness to take care of what we live on. God don't have to do this. He don't need this earth for anything. He don't need anything on this earth, including me and you, for anything. He's already God. He's already almighty. He doesn't need an army. He doesn't need preachers and teachers. He doesn't need a church. But yet because of love, there's grace. And because of grace, here we are. Here we are. Not only is there common grace, but the common grace, it would seem in effect biblically, would try to lead people to what we would call the understanding of the saving grace of God. That God does what he does because he wants to save your soul. He wants to give you eternal life. He wants to redeem you from the curse of the law. Being made a curse his very self. 
when Adam fell from the goodness of God, and when Adam transgressed, he brought on a transgression and a false state nature to all of us here today. And the only hope we would have of being lifted up from our fallen state would be the grace that God offers through his son, Jesus Christ. Other than that, there is no hope for you and I. There is no hope. The saving grace of God. Once again, going over to Ephesians chapter number two, listen to what he says in verse one again. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Listen to verse five. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. Here we find that God's grace has the purpose and it has the goal and it has the aim of quickening you. Amen. Quickening you. A man apart from Christ is dead while he liveth. Only Christ can bring a good thing out of an unclean bad thing. Quicken. It means once again he gives life. Listen to verse 6 of that chapter. And hath raised us up together and made us set together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Not only does the saving grace of God quicken us, but the saving grace of God places us. In a wonderful place. I'm seated today in the heavenlies. I can think and communicate with another world. I can listen to the voice of one who sits on a throne who's not of this world. I have the privilege and I have the opportunity as a man to be placed in a position where I am able to know he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own. I have that privilege today. Grace has made this possible in my life. Oh, God forbid, I said, God forbid that this wonderful grace is taken in vain. God forbid. He mentions in verse number 8 of Ephesians chapter 2, not only does grace quicken us and give us life, not only does it place us in heavenly places, it puts us in a position where we're no longer a child of the devil, but we are a child of the king. He says that saving grace does just that, it saves us. For by grace are you saved through faith. He delivers you. He delivers you from what? You know what? You know what? Get honest with yourself. He delivers us from what? He delivers you from what you know you need delivered from. I don't have the ability to get into your heart and peel it open and look at your heart and know what kind of bars are on your heart this morning, but God does and you do. You know today what kind of strongholds that only God's grace can save you from. God's grace saves us. That means he delivers us. That means he sets us free. That means he, he does the impossible. And then, once God saves us, and we have understood that we got this gracious creator, then, oh, it gets real good, because then there is the teaching grace of God. And this is where, as Christians, we must give great heed. It's one thing to be saved, ladies and gentlemen. And it's one thing for you to be a Christian. But if you're not faithful to the Bible, if you're not faithful to a prayer life, if you're not faithful to the church house, what are you professing for? I say, what are you professing for? You be careful telling people you're a Christian and doing that which grace does not teach of. Christians are taught by grace. And grace teaches us that there's a peculiar life we live. There's a wonderful life to exhibit. If there's ever been a time in the United States of America, we wonder sometimes why so many of our kids have gone astray. We wonder sometimes why so many of our grandchildren have gone astray. Well, look at the moms and dads. I'm not being critical here. But look at them. Listen to the language they hear throughout the week. Look at the church example they got said. It's not much. And I'm not trying to be critical here. But I am trying to show us that sometimes in our personal lives, there is the great need for repentance. 
There is the need for repentance, repenting from a life that is not honoring nor glorifying God. But it is dooming the generation to come and it is what we would call grace in vain. Vain grace. And we all, we need to be so careful for that because I need to remind myself and, and, and of course, and our children are going to make their decisions. You can bring your child here to church and they can sit underneath good, solid, biblical preaching. That's all that's going to happen in this church. If your children are in this church, the only thing they're going to be exposed to is what's right. The only thing they're going to be exposed to is what's righteousness. The only thing they're going to be exposed to is what holiness is. If your child's in this church, the only thing they're going to get is what is right for them. And they can still turn the dotted eye upon something else. But Paul, remember what he said when he wrote to Titus? And he was encouraging Titus to get preachers and line them up and make sure that they could do this and they could do that. And he gave some principles and precepts about this and that. Well, he mentions a very common thing. And he says in verse 11 of Titus chapter 2, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation. Now we just talked about saving grace. Now we're talking about a teaching grace. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. We've already talked about a common grace. The creation today is showing God's grace. The rain is showing God's grace. The flowers are showing God's grace. Creation exhibits the very hand of God. We've already talked about these things. But then he says in verse 12, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that. This is where the local New Testament church needs to get real close to. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's what grace does to the life of a Christian. Grace teaches a Christian, number one, refuse evil. Say no to evil. Say no to sin. Say no to the things of, that, against Scripture. Say no to the things that discourage Christ. Grace teaches us that. Isn't it an interesting thing how sometimes we don't listen to grace teaching us this? And then we put our hand forth anyway. And then how later on we got a black fingernail because the hammer came down later on. And we said, man, I wish I would have paid more attention to that. Wish I would have thought through more of that. There's the teaching grace of rejecting ungodliness and refusing evil desires. He goes on and he says here, not only denying ungodliness, but he mentions worldly lust. I'm talking about temptations, toys. Ladies and gentlemen, I must remind us all, there is nothing in this world that's going to last forever, and there is nothing in this world you are taking with you. If there's something in your life that has got more of an influence on you than grace, it will make grace that's been imparted unto you become in vain. It'll make grace in vain. And we don't want that. God don't want that. And then he says here, to live. He said we should live soberly. And he mentions the word righteously. And he mentions the word godly. Here's what he's saying. Grace teaches you to say no to evil. Grace teaches you to say no to sin. Grace teaches you to reject worldly lust. And grace teaches you to live like Jesus Christ. Grace teaches you to act like Jesus Talk like Jesus. Be like Jesus. That's what grace does. See, grace has got a goal with our lives. It's to conform us to Christ. And anything in my life that doesn't picture Christ, I've got, we've got to be careful with that. And then let me just say quickly and lastly, there is a sufficiency of God's grace. The sufficiency of God's grace. Going back to our thought of what Paul said here. Remember what Paul said? He said, I am what I am by the grace of God. His, his glory was revealed unto me. I spent three years in the desert learning of him. His grace was sufficient in, in education me. My life, my life, the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and died for me. 
Paul said, I die daily. Paul lived a crucified life. He is an example of I am what I am by the grace of God. Sufficient. I don't know, is God's grace sufficient? If you get on the journey today, maybe someone's here today, and you're not saved by grace. Listen, my dear friend, do not let the enemy peddle you on this. If there is one reason why men and women say no to Jesus Christ, it's because they've got an unseen enemy and they don't realize he's at work in their heart. No man, no woman says no to Christ save but the influence of the devil. The devil is a liar and his goal, his one and only goal is to doom men and women and doom their souls by making them reject the wonderful grace of God. Who would reject God's wonderful grace? Who would say no to Jesus Christ? Who would say no to heaven? Who would say no to that? Somebody who doesn't understand that they are being satanically influenced. I was one time satanically influenced to say no to God. Thank God the light came in and I seen things a little different. And I sure do appreciate that day in my life. But concluding here, Paul had a sickness. He had a disease. And he went to God in prayer. And he went to God in prayer again. And he went to God in prayer again. And finally God said, stop. And here's what God told him. My grace is sufficient for thee. Maybe you want to start this journey today. Is this grace going to lead you to the end? Maybe you want to take a step of today of faith and you want to come on out and trust the Lord Jesus Christ and you want to get real super serious about His grace in your life. Is it going to be sufficient next month for you? Is it going to be sufficient for you when everything is turning loose and all hell's breaking loose? Is it going to be sufficient for you when it seems like no one cares and no one loves you and there's nothing there, nothing at all but misery? Is His grace sufficient? Is it? Well, if we would ask Paul, he would say, yes. If we would ask Peter, he'd say, yes. If we'd ask people in this room, they would say, yes. Let me remind us a little bit about the sufficiency. No matter what you go through in life, no matter what you deal with in life as a Christian, God is a very present help in the time of need. Now, one thing about your life, your, our life, we are needy. We're needy all the time. You're needy. If you don't need something right now, you'll need something before the day's over. And the things we need are weighty matters. They're weighty matters. They're heavy matters. They're things that get into our mind and our heart. They're, they're heavy. But listen, I want to remind you of what Jude said about the sustaining sufficiency of God's amazing grace. Here's what he says. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Is he able to keep you from falling? Only if you give him the chance. If you're falling over and over and over, you are not allowing grace to do a work in your life. If you are struggling over and over and over and over, you cannot be allowed to tell yourself what's wrong here. The problem is you. The problem is not nobody else. It's you. It's the way you live. It's the way you think. It's the way you carry yourself. You're not allowing grace to help you be what you ought to be. Don't blame circumstances. Don't go blaming nobody else. Look at yourself in the mirror and let grace have its good work. He says that he is able to keep you from falling. Anybody believe that here this morning? Oh yeah, oh yeah, I believe that. He able to keep you from falling? Hold on, and it gets better. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless. God not only has the ability in this life to keep you from falling, but one day he has the ability, Jesus Christ does, to put you in the very presence of God perfect. Amen. And you wonder about Christ, you wonder where he's at, you wonder about this, you, you don't need to wonder. His grace is sufficient. Listen to what Paul told the church at Corinth, because they were trying to do things themselves. I'm not going to do it with the Bible. I'm not going to do it with the church. I'm going to do a secular program. I'm going to get involved in a secular program. i got to remind us all about that. The devil is real good of honoring secular programs, maybe one year, maybe two, maybe three, maybe five. 
But sooner or later, that thing is going to have fruit that will discourage what should have been done in the beginning. God's word doesn't return void. Man's always does. Man's word pacifies where God's word satisfies. Now watch. Here's what Paul said. And I, we're concluding here. In 2 Corinthians, here's what he told the church at Corinth in his second letter about sufficiency. About sufficiency. Well, I'll tell you what David said while I'm turning here. You know what he said? He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Well, truly, there's something you want. No. Truly, there's something you need. No. Well, truly, your life isn't that rich. Yes. I said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And I meant it. That's sufficiency. Now, here's what Paul said about this sufficiency. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, not that we, uh-oh, not that we are sufficient of ourselves. You better think about this. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. Here's what he's saying this. How dare you as a man saved by grace? How dare you as a woman saved by grace go to yourself for advice? How dare you go to yourself and advice apart from me? That's when the grace is in vain. He says... Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. That's where our sufficiency is at. It's of God. Now, how great is his sufficiency? I'm going to quote one scripture to you. We got a life to live. Some of us here are 15, 14, 12, 50, 80, 70, 56, 61. You've got a life ahead of you. Listen, you don't know this. But man, there are a lot of things, if the Lord wills, there's a lot of things up the road that's got to be worked out in your life. There's a lot of things, ladies and gentlemen, up the road that you don't know quite about. But He does. His grace is sufficient to take you right where you're at and save you. His grace is sufficient to keep you that way all the way, regardless of how long you live. And through this journey, you know what His grace is able to do? And we know that all things work together for good. But it's to a certain group of people. To them that love God. I never asked you if you believed in God. Do you love him? Do you love him? I never asked you if you're saved. Do you love him? I never asked you if you've been baptized. Do you love him? Can you honestly say, I love the Lord Jesus Christ with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I love him with everything I am. This is what grace encourages. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. We are what we are by the grace of God. There's no doubt about that. If you're here today and you've never been saved, I want to tell you how this works. The common grace that you see out there, well, you know that testifies to God. But he, once you get, he gets your attention there, then he starts to come up next to you. And he starts to poke on you. He says, I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you. And ladies and gentlemen, don't you ever forget as Christians, when you're in this place in your life where you seem forsaken and you feel you're all alone and no one cares for you, I want you to know something. God's not gone anywhere. God's not going anywhere. God is right there for you. If you'll look up to him, his grace will be sufficient in anything you ever can be confronted with and encounter in this life. Let's have our heads bowed, please. Father, thank you.